I first saw his photo on a Facebook post. A woman passing by the town by train had spotted him wandering the streets around the station. It looked like a scene from a horror movie. In fact, there were people commenting below actually claiming that the photo was not real. If you are involved in animal welfare in Greece, you see too much suffering every day, but that photo really broke my heart. I had no idea what I was in for when I said, get him here and I'll foster him. I had absolutely no experience with treating dogs like that one. But the next day, two of our volunteers traveled 70 kilometers to get to him, and they managed to catch him. We all met at the vet the same evening. When we took him out of his box, the sight of his suffering body and his absolute terror were so petrifying that we couldn't even cry. All four of us had been around dogs a lot, but there didn't seem to be a right way to behave around this one, so we basically just stood there and watched. We were pretty sure that we had taken him off the streets just to offer him a chance of a dignified death, and that the vet would advise that we put him to sleep, but he didn't. He examined him, took blood samples, and sent us home. He suffered from a very contagious type of mange, so we put him in a small bathroom upstairs. He just laid there in the corner and was so obvious he just needed to be left alone. So we let him rest, and as we were coming down the stairs, we heard him eat. It was so relieving. If he eats, he wants to live. The next morning, the vet called and said, He's fine. Let's begin with the treatment. <laughs> we laughed. We still laugh about it. What he meant was that his vitals were okay and his chances of surviving were very good. But that phrase, he's fine, was just unbelievable. Those first couple of weeks were so overwhelming for both of us. He must have been feeling so safe and secure in that small room that he slept for hours and hours. He would eat four times a day and then just go back to sleep. I felt like I had a tiny treasure to protect and nurture and checked on him a dozen times per day. I never heard a sound coming from that room upstairs. Not barking or scratching, or not even the slightest movement. I'd simply open the door, change his water, put food on his plate and watch him go back to sleep. He must have felt so cozy in that bed that he'd only get up to pee every 24 hours. Within 10 days, he had already grown stronger and started taking small walks out on the terrace. The first time he walked his tail made my heart melt. He was gaining weight and confidence every day and made such a speedy recovery that no one could believe it. We made a weekly update on him on the Facebook page and he looked so much stronger and healthier from one week to another that our first thought of having to put him to sleep now looked simply ridiculous. When we shot the scenes for the after part of his rescue video, it almost looked fake. It had taken Billy less than two months to become a gorgeous, trusting and loving dog. There were in fact people commenting on his rescue video on YouTube that it wasn't the same dog, that it looked fake and that we had actually swapped dogs. <laughs> and then this email arrived from more than 2,000 kilometers away. It was the first and only adoption request we ever had on him, but we would have picked it anyway among a million others. Emma was Greek, living in Switzerland, and had followed Billy's story since day one. We started exchanging emails and messages every day. I'd inform her on anything I knew or thought about what Billy was like, about what he loved or not, and about how he'd behave in a new environment. I would send her photos and videos of him playing with my dogs or taking walks or simply just sitting there being cute. Saying goodbye at the airport was one of the hardest things I ever had to do. I came back home crying, waiting for his flight to arrive. We Skyped once they were home. I missed him so much already and yet I was so happy to finally see him where he belonged. And then the first emails and messages starting arriving with photos and videos of Billy's new life and details on his daily routine and all the progress he was making. 
they allowed me to take a glimpse on his life and I felt so grateful. Within 10 months, Emma and I had exchanged more than 2,300 messages and with every new detail and every new photo, the memory of him would become so vivid and yet so distant. A lot of dogs came after him. Dogs I fostered and loved and helped. But as the months went by, Billy's photos were still my desktop background and my mobile wallpaper and even my Facebook cover. <laughs> it was like, while well, his memory was drifting farther away, I'd try to keep him as close as possible any way I could. And finally, the reunion happened. I had been preparing for it for months since the day I got that message from Emma saying that they might be visiting Greece for Christmas. I was so thrilled and so nervous and had been planning everything, every single detail, everything I'd say or do or feel. But Billy was always too special for anything you could ever plan or imagine about him. He did recognize me, of course. He recognized my dogs and they were so happy to be together again. They ran off playing and doing whatever it is dogs do when they get along. We spent the day together. He was so happy, a happy dog. A dog that had absolutely nothing to do, not only with that hairless bag of bones I had fostered those first weeks, but not even with a healthy, gorgeous animal I had given for adoption 10 months ago. I kept looking at him and even though I knew it was him, in a way it felt that he wasn't. He had been completely formed and shaped by those two amazing people who adopted him and he was most definitely 100% their dog, their pet, their baby. I could finally see it and I was so relieved. So this video is dedicated to Billy's parents for everything they've done and for everything that they'll do but most of all for allowing me to let go the smoothest and most gentle way possible. Thanks.